It's my great pleasure to introduce David Rothkopf. I've been an admirer of David's writing for quite some time, so it's a real uh, honor to have him here to speak at the Rowerton Center. His 2005 book, Running the World, The Inside Story of the National Security Council and the Architects of American Power, which was published in 2005, uh, is a wonderful read. I would recommend it to all of you uh, because it's distinctive, I think, for its narrative voice. He, he makes the history of a powerful institution come alive by allowing those who actually walk the NSC's corridors to speak for themselves. So he conducted exhaustive interviews with pretty much all the major living players in order to piece together the story. And the result is an extremely important contribution to our understanding of American foreign <coughs> policy. His forthcoming book, The Superclass, promises to do the same with the phenomenon of globalization. It is scheduled to come out in multiple languages with uh, Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux sometime early next year? What's our March. March 2008. David is a visiting scholar at the Carnegie Endowment and president and CEO of Garten Rothkopf, an international advisory firm specializing in emerging markets investing and risk management related services. Previously, he was founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of IntelliBridge, a firm offering open source intelligence and advisory services on international issues. Prior to that, he served for two years as managing director of Kissinger Associates. He has also served as deputy under secretary of commerce for international trade policy in the Clinton administration. His talk today will be on his forthcoming book, The Superclass, which in my view is destined for the bestseller list, but I probably shouldn't say that because I'll jinx it. But uh, the topic is incredibly interesting. Those of us gathered in this room, I think, are fortunate indeed to be the first, really the first to hear at Central Arguments. This is the first talk he's giving on the topic of the book. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming David Rothkopf to Middlebury. Thanks, Allison, to all of you. I really appreciate your hospitality. Uh, Allison is right. This is the first time that I uh, am speaking about this uh, new book. And so uh, however interested you may be in how this talk turns out, I'm even more interested. Um, <laughs> it's going to be a bit of a, a voyage of exploration and discovery for all of us, I think. Uh, I, I, I'll talk about it for 20 or 30 minutes, maybe. And then we can talk about a broad range of issues, uh, anything that's on your mind. Uh, I'm probably the least academically uh, reputable discipline, which is a, I'm a, ge a generalist. I'm kind of interested in everything. And uh, it makes, you know, I, I like to think of it as sort of enabling me to have a broad perspective. People who are specialists think of me as a dilettante. Um, <laughs> You know, I'll let you reach your, reach your own conclusions on that. Uh, when I was doing this book, Running the World, uh, you know, a number of people would attack me for a variety of reasons. You know, when I started out, I, I, uh, I thought, well, if I'm a centrist, everybody will like me. And uh, let me just pass this lesson on to you. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's actually the opposite, you know. <laughs> Every, everybody dislikes you for being a, a centrist. And beyond the usual attacks, you know, people would pick up the book and say, oh, you were in the Clinton administration, you're a lefty nut job, um, which is not true. Um, I may be a nut job, but I'm not a lefty nut job. Um, uh, the, you know, one of the other things people would get, particularly overseas, is, well, you think the NSC is running the world? And I, and I was like, well, you know, irony, folks. There's a subtle bit of irony in here. And I didn't want to actually hold up and wave the irony sign, but, you know, it didn't, it didn't come through. Anyway, so, you know, I'd get into these discussions, and, and, and I'd try to point out that some of the people within the NSC thought they were running the world, but in actuality they weren't, which led to another question, which is, well, if they're not, who is? And so that... It was the genesis of superclass. And one of the books that I drew on in doing this is a book that I had to read at, at Columbia when I was an undergraduate because we had all of these requirements, uh, which was a book by a guy named C. Wright Mills, 
uh, who was a, a famous and academically respected lefty nut job from Columbia, um, uh, who wrote a book called The Power Elite. And The Power Elite, which was published 50 years ago, um, looked at how in the United States there were political people, business people, military people that were kind of an interlocking directorate that ran the country. And nobody had sort of looked about this in terms of the era of globalization. You know, who's, as, as globalization is being shaped, who's shaping it? And what are the consequences of having those people shape it? And, you know, needless to say, you know, we're in a world in which inequality is growing. We're in a world in which uh, some people have a leg up and other people seem to be being left behind for a variety of reasons. Somebody's setting the rules. Somebody's influencing the outcomes. Who's doing it? And, of course, if you go on the Internet and type in, you know, any of the favorite sort of trigger words for conspiracy theorists, there are lots of people out there. You know, I'm a Jewish boy from New Jersey, and so, you know, I grew up with world Jewish conspiracy. And, and you know, and I was like, great, where do I sign up? <laughs> um, you know, I mean, there aren't that many Jews. I could, like, get a good job in it. Some, like, I knew a guy once, so he, he used to say, you know, I'm in charge, yes, there is one, and I'm in charge of world zinc prices. <laughs> and I was like, and I, I was like, you know, good. Well, as it turns out, you know, things actually, if you study it a little bit, haven't turned out so well for the Jews over history. And you got to think that if there were a world Jewish conspiracy, they would have turned out a little bit better. Um, so, you know, there, there, there are a whole host of theories like that about different groups that are in charge. And there have been throughout time. And, and so the question was, well, What's really going on? You know, are, are, you know, do these people really, you know, are there people who really get together in a back room? Uh, uh, how, how do elites interact with each other? How are they interacting with the rest of us? And what are the, what are the consequences? And so what I, you know, did first as I started to examine it was I looked at the, the concentration of power to see whether there was any kind of real pattern that would strike you. And strike me, it did. I mean, it, it's really, really striking. For example, the top 2,000 companies in the world have 70 million employees worldwide. If you add in their families, that's probably 450, 500 million people associated with those top 2,000 companies. So the CEOs of those companies are daily making decisions that impact the lives of half a billion people. But it's more than that, because there are companies that supply to those companies. There are companies that distribute for those companies. You know, there are 30,000 companies in the Procter & Gamble family of suppliers and distributors and so forth. So you look at that and you think, wow, those CEOs are making decisions that may be affecting a, a multiple. Well, let's just say the multiple's two. There's six, seven billion people on Earth, but the bottom four billion people on Earth, they don't have anything. I mean, it, literally, we're at a point where the, the top 1,000 people in terms of wealth on Earth and billionaires have the same wealth as the bottom 2.5 billion people. Okay? That's just, that's the world you live in, right? And so these 2,000 are impacting, of the 2 billion who actually make a living, half of them. We think, wow, that's kind of interesting, those CEOs. But surely the CEOs report to somebody. And the answer is, yes, they do. They report to the people who determine whether they get to keep in their jobs, which are shareholders. Well, how did the shareholders show whether they like the company or not? They trade stock. They sell it or they buy it. Well, 30 to 50% of all the trading that takes place in global financial markets is conducted by hedge funds, of which there are only 10,000 on Earth. But the top 300 hedge funds control something in the neighborhood of 80 or 85% of all the trading that they do, all, hold all the assets, and, and thus control the trading. The top 100 control 60 or 65% of the assets, and thus the trading. So now you've got a small, small group of super influential chief 
investment officers. Controlling the fate of a small, small group of CEOs who control the fate of billions of people. And if you look at it, place after place after place, there's super concentration of the 1,000, 4,000 religions in the world. There are only 10 that have over a million adherents. There are only two, if you define them broadly, Christianity and Islam, that have a billion adherents. So very concentrated. There are only two people in the world that have the ability, I mean, there are two people in the world that have the ability to have launch authority over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons, right? The President of the United States and the President of Russia. Um, there are, there's really only one army in the world that has the ability to wage a global war. Uh, there are only a handful that have anything like a modern air force or a modern navy. So military or in religion or in politics, in business and in finance, there are very, very few people. So what I did was I said, let's, let's define this top tier. Let's come up with a definition. The definition I came up with, and there's a lot of ways to do this, I'm doing this just to, you know, to illustrate the issue, was people who regularly made decisions that affected the lives of millions of people across borders. We'll, we'll define that group as a global superclass. How many are there? And so we started counting them up. You know, the heads of the biggest companies, the heads of the biggest financial institutions, the heads of the biggest uh, government agencies uh, in governments that could do that. Most governments in the world don't actually influence millions of people across borders. Most of them are inwardly focused, and most people in them are fairly weak and can't make decisions that impact them. So we ended up with about 6,000 people. 6,000 people out of 6 billion people. So each one of those 6,000 people is one in a million. And those 6,000 people we were then able to study. And when you look at a group of people like that, you see some really stark and fascinating things, some of which might not surprise you, some of which might outrage you. 94.7% uh, of those people are men. Okay, but just as a, as a footnote, more than half of the people on the planet are women. The single, um, the single um, uh, most underrepresented group of people on the planet in the world's power elite are women. Okay? Most of them are old white guys. Um, you know, they're average about 60 years old. They're on one side of the Atlantic or the other. Um, uh, kind of astonishingly to me, uh, almost 30% of them went to one of just 20 s colleges. Um, now, you know, that's kind of, this is 6,000 people from every corner of the earth. And if you pick this list of 20 colleges, almost 30% of them went to one of those 20 colleges. So it's a pretty homogeneous group. And then periodically you would find them gathered in places around the world. Davos, Switzerland, for the World Economic Forum. You got a couple of thousand of people like that, or at Bilderberg, or at the Bohemian Grove, or at the Boao Forum in in in, in China, um, or at Carlos Slim Helu's uh, 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 fathers and sons meeting, which he has set up for the the the, the fathers and the heirs to the biggest businesses in Latin America. And you know, in every industry, there there are things like this where you get the top guys together. But they're meeting with each other. And if you look more closely at the group, you notice that this group has globalized more rapidly than any other group. Why? Well, first of all, they have the means to globalize. Now they just, I mean, they've got internet access and they've got phones and stuff, but, but a lot of them have planes. You know, a lot of them have the ability to travel easily. You know, they're, 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 there are 10,000 <coughs> private jet aircraft in the world. And of the 10,000 private jet aircraft, maybe 1,500 of them are Gulfstream G5 aircraft. Um, and there are a bunch of other makers of those kind of things. But there are a few thousand people, the people who run companies and governments. We're going someplace isn't about a pain in the neck. 
you know, they don't wait in, in line to go through, you know, you just call up the guy and say, you know, get the plane ready. You go down to the general aviation terminal, you get on the plane. If the weather's lousy, you tell the pilot that you want to go to Barbados. I mean, it's, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not quite that simple, but, it, but, it, but it's, it's a lot easier for them to get around and to go to these forums and interact with each other. So this is the most rapidly globalizing group on the planet. They are also, however, the group that is having the greatest influence on globalization. Now, having said all of that, these guys, um, and they are mostly guys, these guys are, are not you know, co-conspirators. Many of them are rivals. But what happens is that periodically their interests align. If you're a billionaire, or you're the CEO of a company, even if it's competing companies, your interests align. You, you'd like less regulation. You'd like lower taxes. You'd like more freedom to move about from place to place in the world. And if you look at the history of the past 25 years of the world, a kind of a consensus has, has emerged. And I would say one of the greatest powers of the people of a superclass because they're running the companies. You know, you, you ever go into a meeting? If you, if you go into a room with a teacher and the teacher says, you know, the funniest guy in the world is Dane Cook, you know, who's actually not the funniest guy in the world and in fact, as far as I can tell, is not even a little funny. But, um, <laughs> but, but if the teacher says the funniest guy in the world is Dane Cook, you know, you might think the next day to come in and say, well, you know, I saw Dane Cook in this dumb movie with Jessica Simpson, and boy, was he funny. Why? Because it's the teacher, and you're going to get a grade. And if your boss says, you know, X, I, I believe in this, or I believe in that, oddly enough, you're going to start to adopt some of those views. So the greatest power of the superclass is the ability to shape conventional wisdom. And... The conventional wisdom about how the world should work over the past 25 years, you could call it uh, Reaganomics or Reagan Thatcherism, or you could call it Volcker Greenspanism, or you could, with deference to my friend uh, Tom Friedman of the New York Times and, uh, and the Nobel Prize winning economist, you could call it Friedman Friedmanism. Um, but, you know, w w what you end up with there is. Government bad, markets good, leave it to the markets, markets will take care of everything. Well, you know, how does that work for us all? Over the course of the past 25 years, inequality in the world has grown more rapidly than uh, at almost any other time in history. It is almost as bad as it's been any time in history. It is worse in the United States in some places than anywhere else. The ratio of the richest fifth to the poorest fifth in New York used to be 8 to 1. It's now 80 to 1. The ratio of the salaries of CEOs used to be uh, 25 to 1. It's now 350 to 1. Now, you've read about that. You've read about it in the paper for years and years and years now. Oh, CEOs, they get paid a lot. <laughs> Have you read about the change in CEO pay structures? No. In fact, you find that um, the closer you are to the middle of this circle, the more you benefit from this conventional wisdom. There are studies that show that companies that have boards that have more professional directors on them, in other words, directors who are on a number of boards, pay their CEOs more, not less. Even though there is not a single study that demonstrates that a big name CEO improves performance. Not a single one. There's no evidence to, to support that this is a good idea. Um, and in fact, there's some evidence to su support the idea that it's not a good idea. So, Inequality is growing everywhere. And, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you, you end up being drawn back to, I'm sure, an economist some of you have studied in the early part of this century, Vilfredo Pareto, who, in looking at income distribution in Italy, came up with the famous 2080 rule, um, you know, which is 20% of the people have 80% of the wealth or, or, or the income. And, in fact, the 2080 rule is strange. And it's, you know, we could have a metaphysical discussion about it because it occurs everywhere. You know, if you're breeding championship rabbits, 20% of the rabbits produce 80% of the future champions. Uh, if, you're, if you're picking jockeys winning races, 20% of the jockeys win 80% of the races. If you're in the record business, 20% of the records 
produce 80% of the profits and thus enable you to do the, I mean, it's just, now, sometimes it's 10 and 90, so, you know, don't, don't take me too literally here, but the point is there's incredible patterns of concentration. And in fact, one of the things that I think we need to think about as we're looking at these elites, before you start getting out your pitchforks and your, and, and your torches and say, let's go march on wherever these elites are and, and we'll get them out of office, is A, there have always been elites. B, elites emerge everywhere. You're at an elite academic institution. Okay? You fought like heck to be separated from other people and to get into a place like this. Um, you will benefit from this system. So you're going to start rationalizing it pretty soon. You may be starting now in the middle of my talk here. Um, but but, but um, uh, the, 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 the reality is that we need elites. You know, I mean, it, and, and, and you can't escape them. They exist in everything. You know, they, look, at, look at tennis. You know, there's everyday tennis players. They look like this. Um, <laughs> You know, there's sort of better tennis players who beat the everyday tennis players regularly. That's a small group. There's the club champion who beats that person on a fairly regular basis. You know, you might get the college level. Then you get the top pros, you know, who are the way better, you know, quantum level better. And then you get Roger Federer, <laughs> right, who's like from another planet, you know. He's from the planet tennis. And he's just better than anybody else. And Tiger Woods is better than anybody else, and Michael Jordan is better than anybody else, and Steve Schwartzman, who's running the Blackstone Group, is doing it better than anybody else, or maybe him and Henry Kravis and a couple of other people, and in industry after industry and place after place, you get elites. They're not going to go away. And in fact, they do a lot of good things. You know, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, they give their money. People invent things that are beneficial. There are, there's leadership. We need leaders. So you don't want to get rid of elites. They exist. But if they're perpetuating bad ideas, or if the system is being imbalanced by, 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 by the, the preponderance of their influence, then you've got a problem. And that's really what really gets to me. Because you, know, you will go in and you will take courses here in economics and stuff like that if you can't avoid it. And what will happen is that you will see that there will be a lot of um, studies on income inequality. But there are no studies on inequality in the distribution of power. You know? And in your studies on income inequality, you'll read about people defending this system of leaving it to the markets. And I went around, I talked to hundreds of people, and they would say, well, you know, it's much better than it used to be because it used to be just kings had this, and now average people can have this, although the average people are now much richer and more removed from society than the kings were. And you sort of drill down and they say, but, it, you know, the, what we've got is better because it's a meritocracy. Well, wait a minute. You know, first of all, is it a meritocracy? You know, you know, well, you've got this idea, the Horatio Alger notion, right, which is if you work hard, you know, and you, and you do everything, things will turn out. You'll succeed, right? Except that's not true. All of you know it, particularly those of you who are unfortunate enough to be, you know, closer to my age. You went to college, you saw people who were less smart than you, who now have you know, giant homes and boats and all this other stuff, what happened? You worked as hard as they did. Well, you know, there are some interesting factors in here that you don't read about in your economics books. You know, economics books, they're great because they say, this will happen because the system works this way, ceteris paribus. Okay? So cetera, you know, some of you, there's a, you know, it means all things being equal. Guess what? They're not. Um, you know, this system works great. All things being equal, except all things aren't equal. One of the most central absence of, of equality in the system is what I would call the inequitable distribution of luck. Now, you know, oh, well, that's ridiculous. That's, you know, what are you talking about, the inequitable distribution of luck? That's silly. This is an academic institution. We shouldn't be talking about such a thing. Well, imagine for a moment somebody just like you, your DNA even, your brain, your energy, a perfect clone who works just as hard as you, except instead of being born in Scarsdale or wherever you were born, they're born in Papua New Guinea. Guess what? They are SOL as far as luck concerns, right? <laughs> they, 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 it, it doesn't matter 
that they have talent. It doesn't matter that they work hard because geography is very cruel on the planet Earth. And most people, most people are born in places where you can't succeed, where you don't get a piece of this pie. Most people are born in places where terrible things are happening. 30,000 children die every day under the age of five of preventable causes. Lack of water, lack of medicine, lack of food. Preventable causes. Do you know how much it would cost to fix that? For the world, roughly two months in Iraq. OK, well, who's allocating the resources? 30,000 people, that's three World Trade Centers a day. Who's deciding that those people are less important than the one World Trade Center, which has cost a trillion dollars and 680,000 Iraqis and 3,000 American soldiers and so forth? Who gets to make those decisions? Well, the system gets to choose. The system has a way. It has patterns. They send people to Middlebury, and then they go off, and they run big Wall Street firms, and then they get to pay for people's campaigns, and the people in those campaigns get to be president, and the people who give the money get to influence the president on the way things go. This is just the way it happens. Of course, Middlebury is an enlightened institution, so the more that happens, the better. But there are other institutions that are less enlightened, believe it or not. Um, and so you end up with a system that is, that, is, that is full of flaws in that regard. I'll just talk about two other things, because I want to make sure that we stay within time. It's a 411-page book, and I'm you know, on page four, so I'm going to have to speed it up. <laughs> um, the, but, but there are some other consequences of this, kind of big picture consequences that are worth um, thinking about. One of the most important of these is this. We live in a world in which there are two kinds of global institutions. Any of you taking course in international institutions, you may want to write this down. One, weak. Two, dysfunctional. Those are the only two <laughs> kinds of global institutions that we have. Okay, they, um, you know, if you pick your favorite one: the UN, the W, you know, HO, the WTO, the, you know, the OAS is a, you know, great one. It's a great building in Washington. The OAS is in a lot of more. It'd be excellent for like bar mitzvahs and weddings, but. Um, <laughs> Other than that, it serves no purpose, OK? Um, but the, 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 uh, the reality is that these, the, this institutional void, particularly when it comes to major issues of globalization, is acutely felt. Who regulates global financial markets? Who can responds to transnational threats? Well. The answer is usually either nobody or, damn it, the United States is getting involved again. You know, I mean, it's one of those, it's, it's one of those two things. But in some of those areas, interesting things have evolved. So for instance, if there's a global bond market crisis, like there has been recently, what happens is that the head of the Fed calls the head of 14 banks, 14. In fact, the head of Goldman Sachs refers to this as the 14 families in a not quite as funny as you would think, reference to the godfather. Um, and the 14 families get together in a room, and they talk about how to manage the crisis. And this is the reason that you get people, perfectly well-intentioned people, people that I used to work with in the Clinton Mr. other industries, who say, we don't need regulation. We'll do self-regulation. Oh, come on. Can you imagine one of those bankers getting into a self-regulating taxi cab? or brushing his teeth with self-regulated toothpaste? No, why, you can't trust those toothpaste makers, but bankers, bankers you can trust. Um, uh, and, and, you know, but you get, you get and, and it's in area after area after area where big people in an industry will get together, where arms makers will get together. Now, I'm not, you know, and I'm not talking about weird conspiracies. They just set up laws, they set up enforcement mechanisms, they support candidates and so forth. And what happens is that a huge amount of what is happening in terms of globalization is being guided by informal clusters of people, sometimes private sector, sometimes public, sometimes NGOs, mix. A lot of cases, NGOs get involved, involved in important influential roles in this. Well, why is that happening? 
why don't we have stronger institutions? Well, the reason we don't have stronger institutions is in order to have strong international institutions, you have to cede sovereignty to that institution. Well, let me give you some career advice. If you run for political office and you suggest that we cede sovereignty to an institution that's transnational, you will be out of business. It happens all the time. It's the third rail of politics. There was a German politician who said, let's make the EU a little bit stronger in this regard. And he was like, done, literally. The, the words came out of his mouth, and he <laughs> evaporated like a special effect in a movie. And the same thing happens in the United States. You can't, you know, so, so what are we doing? Well, we're making a trade, but we're, we're not aware of the trade that we're making because we preserve our sovereignty, and in exchange, we give up democracy. Because the people who are in these informal groups aren't chosen by anybody. They're not. Now, are they bad people? No, they're not bad people. Some of them are, not all of them are. They actually, however, have different agendas. Corporate leaders are legally obligated to think of one thing, which is shareholder return. That's why they're paid. If they don't think of shareholder return, they're undercut. I mean, they're they're breaking the law. They're 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 undermining the 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 the, the fiduciary bargain that's been struck. Most of the people in these markets, most of these influential people, and money has something to do with influence, uh, have a different agenda than the public good. And and you know the the people who say we'll leave it to the market say well government's lousy. Government can't do this kind of stuff. You know, look at, look at government bungles education, government bungles health, and so forth. Well, yeah, a lot of governments do. But, you know, companies screw up too, and what do you do? You say, fix the company. But when governments screw up, they say, let's not leave it to the government. How about fix the government? It's a cop-out to say there is no role for government, because if you're old, the market doesn't want to have anything to do with you. If you are sick, the market doesn't want to have anything to do with you. You know, and I'm a markets guy. I'm a pro-markets guy. But there are limits. We have to know what they can help advance. We have to know what they can't. They're not going to take care of the public good. As Bill Bradley said when he was running for president, and there was a debate about this particular subject, he said, um, you know, the, the, the reason for creation of human societies is not the enrichment of all of the citizens. It's something else. It's a better quality of life. Fairness is an issue in how a society works. I view the sort of the world as a spectrum. Uh, you know, po in political philosophy, those who emphasize freedom on one hand, those that emphasize justice on the other hand. And we've been sort of overly tilting in the one direction. And you, you need to pull it back every so often because there are huge, unprecedented, mind-boggling injustices taking place in the world right now. And while these people don't sit in a room and vote on it and have the outcomes happen, they influence it vastly more than we do. And if, you know, I mean, think about it. You know, you may think, well, that's, you know, crazy conspiracy talk. But, you know, who has more influence over the outcome of U.S. foreign policy, you or the CEO of Exxon? Okay. Who, who, who is going to touch more lives, you or Osama bin Laden. You know, there are people who are in positions to make a difference. You know, if the Pope says something, there are a billion people who, at some level, are being asked to listen, and many who believe that they should listen. So if they're a small group and they have more power, what do you do? Well, what happens in societies over history is we create government structures in order to regulate that balance. You know, that's, you know, that's what happened. The Magna Carta says, well, you're the king, but you report to some other people and so forth. But we're in the global era. This is happening outside of the realm of countries. The biggest players have, shipped, have sort of floated off of geographical bounds. There are 180 entities in the world that have annual sales or revenue flow in excess of $50 billion. The majority of them are companies. A minority of them are countries. 
Okay? Exxon is the size of Sweden. Okay? Except Sweden is organized around the idea that the government reports to the people and supports a public good. And Exxon is organized around the idea that the CEO reports to the board and the shareholders and supports the profitability of Exxon. Not an entirely bad thing, but there needs to be some kind of balance in there. And the balance is out of the system because now, you know, corporations were created in the 14th century. The first corporation was a, uh, a Scandinavian mining company that mined copper. And the brilliant idea behind a corporation was that you could have an entity that would fictionally, it would have this fiction that it was a, a, like a human. It had certain rights, legal rights, that would accrue to it. So it was within the jurisdiction, the legal jurisdiction of the government. Well, now it's above the legal jurisdiction of the government. And what you've got is big companies will go and they'll say, oh, hi, you're Belgium. We'd like to be there. We'll locate some jobs there. We'll do this. But we don't want these labor, labor regulations and we don't want these taxes. And you'll say, sorry, fella, we're going to do that. And they say, well, Mr. Thailand over here, he has a different idea. You want to reconsider your position? Well, who's got the power in that transaction? Who's got the power? Well, the governments have some power, but the corporations all of a sudden have a different kind of power, and the system isn't set up to deal with it. The system isn't set up to deal with huge nation, who, huge entities as bigger, bigger than governments with a global agenda, with no sort of commitment or obligation to the public good, that have the same power as the lawgivers. We've come to a point, a juncture. It's like, you know, you know, 400 years ago in the birth of the nation state. Well, though these things like nation states, they're not, you know, they, they, they don't exist throughout history. If you look at all of human history, the idea of the nation state, which you accept as commonplace, has existed for a very small period of that history. And it's got to move on to something different. If issues are transnational and proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, preservation of the environment, spread of disease, immigration, commercial regulation. Those are all transnational now. If you don't have institutions to deal with those, then they will be dealt with in an inequitable way. And inevitably, what has happened throughout history is that when inequalities take place of, of, of scale much smaller than ours, there's a backlash. And the backlash brings down the one elite and replaces it. Now, typically what happens is when that elite, whether it's in ancient Greece or in China or in the, the 19th century of America with the robber barons, is replaced, it's replaced by a bunch of people who stand up and say, we're going to bring down that elite because they're unfair to you, the people. And then they bring them down and they become the new elite. And the deal doesn't really improve for the people. They're just using that as a moment to switch control from one elite to another. Well, I think we're approaching a moment of inflection because the institutional structure and the legal structure of the planet Earth isn't working for the people of the planet Earth. It's creating huge disparities. It is not keeping up with the reality of what international society is like. And changes are possible. Now, you guys say, what are you talking about? Are you saying there's going to be a global revolution? I mean, the system at the core is going to change. You know, is, well... No, not necessarily, but yes, maybe. And we have to think this way. because you know, I'm from a generation, I was raised, you know, I was six years old, and somebody said, well, there's a Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Cubans, and we're going to have a nuclear war. And you know, I lived my entire life thinking there's going to be a global thermonuclear war. And, I, you know, and, and all of a sudden, one, you know, like in a, in a couple of months, in 1999, it stopped being our concern. The Soviet Union, the most powerful dark force on the earth, disappeared. Okay? It happens all the time that the order changes. It happens frequently throughout history that order changes. And it changes when it's unsustainable. As Herb Stein, the chairman of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, once said, if something is unsustainable, that means it won't be sustained. Okay? <laughs> We are now in a situation that because of the inequities, because of the obsolescence of the system, because of the concentration of the power in the hands of a few who aren't the same as everybody, 
tension is being built into the system. How it resolves itself will affect everybody in this room's lives. Now, one last thing, and I will wrap it up with this 60-second thing. This group of elites is changing. They are transatlantic now. In 20 years, they won't be. If you look at the 100 richest people in China, many of them now in the richest people in the world, uh, half of them are under the age of 40. They have a different view of the world. It's going to become a much more Asian group. That has implications. Now, I believe diversity, you know, representing the world, is a good thing. But one of the Asian views, just to be a little bit controversial about this, that prevails in all the governments of the region and many of the companies is countries shouldn't meddle in other countries' affairs. Do the deal and go home and take care of your own business. China, I'd be very happy to have your oil. Sudan, you take care of your life the way you want to take care of your life. Um, and, you know, compared to unilateralist American evangelical nuttiness, maybe that sounds like a refreshing change. <laughs> but having said that, it's morally neutral. And good and evil does exist in the world. And consequently, having a system that runs towards moral neutrality where there aren't forces out there saying this would be better and let's advance that which is better, that's not necessarily a good thing either. And if elites are the people who set conventional wisdom, then we have to ask whether all the changes affecting them are going to be positive. And is it always the case of these things? It's not clear. It's a mix. But we've got to study it. And I, you know, doing this book was a first step towards studying it. And now talking about it will be another step. And sooner or later, I'll figure it out a little. And then maybe we'll all figure it out a little. But anyway, I appreciate your giving me the chance to come and talk to you about it a little bit today. No, I'll just take them, you know, I, you know, use the, I've been told people are going to get up and leave and stuff, and I'm, you know, cool with that. I will probably cry softly to myself, so <laughs> I'm going to make sure this ends at, at 1.30 uh, so that you don't have the display of me breaking down in front of everybody. Well, let's start over there, and then we'll go over here. You mean like the black waters of this world? This is your question. Well, say, say, say what you spent your summer. Well, I would like to know what happened for three months and more or less didn't destroy them specifically, but uh, worked and played areas where they had to do with the, these people. And all I can tell you is there's uh, sort of the snowball effect with these companies. They're, they're developing in Virginia or in uh, San Francisco. They're developing in the third world as well. The militias are now registering as private companies. And uh, I wanted to comment on that. Well, I mean, first of all, Allison knows more about this stuff than anybody. And so I'm a little bit reluctant to speak uh, on the subject, but I can't help myself. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, and I do, talk, I do talk about it a little bit in the book. And, and, and you know, it is, a, it is an important phenomenon. Significant portion of what was, uh, for instance, uh, military force is now distributed by these groups. There are groups outside of Washington that will allow you to buy a group of Navy SEALs and deploy them in the world uh, to do missions that once only a government could do. Uh, and uh, there are groups that will you know, assume a lot of roles. To make a long story short, and we were talking about this earlier, but you know, there are more than twice as many people acting on the ground in Iraq now as there are troops. These are people to whom we have outsourced. However, had the President of the United States come to the American people and said, well, I would like to have 350,000 people on the ground in Iraq, first of all, it might have raised some eyebrows. Secondly, if they wanted it to be done by the military, he would have then done an analysis, or somebody would have, or might have. Well, they probably wouldn't have and didn't. But the point is, <laughs> they should have. And, and, and they would have done an analysis that would have shown that you can't do that without a draft. And if you had a draft, 
then all of a sudden this wouldn't be a war about poor brownish or black people in Iraq. It would involve white people from suburbia. And you would all of a sudden have the kind of pushback that you did the last time you had a war where that happened in Vietnam. So it wouldn't have been as politically sustainable. You also are spending, you know, we've spent half a billion, half a trillion dollars. We may spend three quarters of a trillion. We may spend a trillion dollars there. But a lot of that money is going to these people. And uh, you've got a very strange phenomenon where a, a foot soldier for Blackwater makes more than the Secretary of Defense. But we're willing to pay for it so we don't have to have too many troops. And it's got all sorts of interesting political ramifications because then you're allowed to send a smaller number of troops. It looks like a smaller involvement. People aren't paying that much attention to the checkbook. The troops that are on the ground we can't criticize because we live in a country where to say anything bad about the military is committing sacrilege. Um, and these other people are able to do stuff sub rosa. And then if something bad happens and they accidentally kill 11 Iraqi civilians, you say, oh, that was Blackwater's fault. Now, admittedly, Blackwater was there doing a job given to them by the United States government, paid for by the United States government, with people who used to work for the United States government or some other military who are now under the command or the guidance of the United States government, but they were in the private sector. So it creates a whole bunch of gray areas, and it changes the power st structure, and they will continue to grow because it's a lot easier to be a government leader and hire somebody than it is to take a government employee and send them into these kind of situations. And so I think, I think it's an important issue to watch. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, with some of the female world leaders in the 5.3 billion dollar budget, what percentage of that would be women? Well, I mean, you know, there, there are a bunch. You know, there's some heads of state. Um, there's some heads of government. You know, the president of Chile is a woman, and the president of India is a woman. and Chancellor of Germany is a woman, and you know there there there's some heads of some major multilateral organizations that are women, and there's some business <laughs> leaders that are women. Although, you know, and 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 in legislatures around the world, we're patting ourselves on the back. You know, in the United States, what is it, 11, 12 percent are now women. I mean, you know, there there are some people, women, who have you know sort of made it up the chain. But I'll tell you one thing. I must have interviewed a dozen women CEOs who, and I would say to them, you know, there's this incredible misrepresentation here. Isn't it outrageous? And with one exception of the dozen people I talked to, they all said, oh, women get pregnant. They said, women go and do something else. It's just they can't work in the same way. And I was like flabbergasted because I, I'm a fossil, right? I went to school in the 70s. There was a revolution going on. Things were going to be different. Women were equal, all this kind of stuff. And, we, we, and it just sort of frittered away. There were some changes that happened, but all of these old views remain, and the women who are at the top are not champions of other women. Many of the women are at the top like being different. Like, what do they all have in common? Do most of them not have families? Or? Uh, no, some of them have families, but you know, they have a lot in common with the people who have been successful. The ones that I talked to, you know, they went to the right schools, they worked hard, they stayed focused. Um, they were fairly lucky. Um, and, and as most successful people are, they were pretty monomaniacal. And there's a little section in my book called The Psychopathology of Success. <laughs> um, and the reality is that to get to a very high level, you have to set a lot of things aside. And if you went and talked to a head of state or a head of a big company, eight times out of 10, not 100% of the time, you would find that they set aside things that you would consider absolutely critical to have a balanced life. Um, and that many of them are highly narcissistic, and some of them are a little bit obsessive. And you, know, you can come up with a whole host of other psychopathologies that lead to success, which, although it has nothing to do with this book, you know, ties to one of my few basic rules about life which, you know, since we're having a folksy conversation here in the Vermont countryside, I will give you one of my few basic rules <laughs> about life, which is that unsuccessful people are kept from success by their neuroses. And successful people are successful because of their neuroses. 
Okay, there are no people without neuroses. <laughs> um, but you know, you know, somebody <laughs> could have you know OCD, and they like get up, turn around 13 times, touch their nose 13 times, can't get out of the house because they're doing everything 13 times. They don't succeed. Somebody else puts everything on a list, checks the list twice, drives everybody around them nuts, making sure that they're going up and down the list, and they're successful. You know, so the, the, my advice to you is don't try to get rid of your neuroses. Try to use them. <laughs> yes? It seems to me that this is about accrual of wealth, and that has a lot to do with energy. We have a lot of energy discussions today. I'd like to know what peak oil and global warming may have to do with uh, how it may impinge on these, uh, the companies and the way will go as you can discuss. Well, I don't think it's going to change the fact that there are elites. It'll change, to some extent, who are the elites. I, you know, I'm not a peak oil um, big believer. I think that we've still got plenty of oil left around, and we keep finding ways, you know, oil sands and other discoveries and so forth, and we're, we'll find plenty of petroleum, but I think climate change is real, and I don't think we're going to be willing to sustain it, and I think instability in these regions is real, and I don't think we want to uh, encourage these guys. You know, you look at the people who are producing the oil. They're not really nice people. Some of them are actually pretty nasty people, and so we don't want to support that. And technology is making advancements into alternative energy possible, and so things will happen. You know, 50% of all the world's exports of biofuels come from Brazil. 80% of all of the world's exports of biofuels come from this hemisphere. 80% are consumed in this hemisphere. So this hemisphere has an edge in that particular area, and other areas will have, you know, the tropical regions have an edge in that particular area, and other, other, other areas will benefit. And so you know, some people will sort of um, rise up among the elites, um, but don't expect the elites to change. You know, the same thing happened with the Internet, right? The Internet was born, and all of a sudden, there are guys in garages, and they were making a billion dollars, or in the case of these guys with Facebook, $10 billion uh, to three, you know, to a bunch of guys who, like, four, three, four years ago were at Harvard going, oh, God, I can't get a date. And, 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 and not that this is the problem of everybody at Harvard. I don't want to, give, to cast aspersions here. But, 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 you know, the origin of Facebook, which I actually talk about in the book because my research assistant was actually at Harvard with them, not dating them. Um, and, 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 and they um, uh, uh, initially started out with doing one of these websites that sort of showed who's hot and who's not. And they got in a lot of trouble. And so then they said, well, let's change it around, something else with faces. And, you know, and Microsoft three days ago says, well, we'll give you $500 million for 5% of your company. It's like, my, my, you know, it's, a, it's amazing. But guess what happened to all those people? Bill Gates and, you know, uh, Scott McNeely and, you know, Paul Allen and all that. Well, they were young, aspiring, wonderful. They, they, the whole world was going to be different when they became the big guys. And they became the big guys, and they're the same. You know, and Bill Gates is a predatory competitor, and you look at the way Microsoft conducts its business, and you look at the way John D. Rockefeller conducted the, the formation of Standard Oil, and it's out of the same playbook, right? Or right, look at Google and Yahoo. We're going to make the world different, except in China, if we could get some market share, we will give you some censorship. Thank you very much. Nice deal. Um, so I don't think that, the, you know, the rise of these people is going to necessarily produce a major uh, transformation in the nature of things, although hopefully it will reduce the influence of the Saudi oil minister and of the Russian minister in charge of this and of Hugo Chavez and a few other people. Not soon. Not, it's not going to be a big thing. I'll give you a little tiny footnote insight into this whole thing to give you a sense of how the world works. And uh, it's a small world that I, that, that I know a little bit about. There's a big debate in the United States about ethanol. And part of it is that we grow corn here in the United States. And the reason we make ethanol out of corn is because we grow politicians in Iowa. We were talking about this. And since politicians have to go through Iowa to become president, they kiss the collective posteriors of the people of Iowa. And so they say, well, we are going to give you subsidies in order to grow your corn. And we grow corn with one-tenth the efficiency per acre in Iowa that pe people produce sugar cane that turns into ethanol in Brazil. So they, these guys are not stupid. They create a 54 cent a gallon tariff to keep Brazilian sugar-based ethanol out of the United States. Well, that's very interesting. 
and this is bad for the Brazilians, and you know, who've got to pay all this tariff and so forth. Except, guess what? 600 million barrels, I mean, 600 million gallons of ethanol comes into the United States every year from Brazil. 400 million of it comes through without these tariffs. Really? Well, how does that happen? Well, some of it goes to the Caribbean and gets the water taken out of it and goes into the United States. But the interesting twist is the most of it comes into the United States and is then blended with fuel by the big oil companies who then go back to the government, thanks to a ruling that they managed to engineer, and say, this is just an ingredient. Rebate the duty. So guess who pays the duty? The United States government. The bulk of the people paying the duty on the importation of ethanol are the U.S. taxpayers who are paying it to oil companies. What, what a spectacular you know, convolution of everything that was originally intended in it. And it just goes to show the little ways that people with disproportionate power can you know, rig the system so that they benefit. We've got time for two more questions. Yes? You're describing the, the, the power elite as at best being amoral. If one posits that there are traditional cultures and moral values out there you know, across the spectrum, how do those non-elite voices of, of morality, wherever they come up across, influence, influence the power? Well, first of all, I wouldn't describe them as being amoral. I was saying in one, there's a certain set of circumstances where you could see an amoral trend emerging, but I would describe the power elite as any other group as being polymoral. There's some good people, there's some bad people, there's some people mixed, there's some people who don't care so much about morality, there's some people who care a lot about morality. It's, 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 it's a mixture. But it does, you know, it, it depends a lot on the cultural influences and the people who get to the top. To the extent to which you have a system that actually allows more people to get to the top because it provides for education, because you allow people to become stakeholders in the wealth growing process in ways you don't currently, because you are counterbalancing the things that give the people in power an edge. And by the way, it's much worse in the emerging world than it is here, where the few still control much as they did in the, in the colonial era. If you counter, that's a good thing because you're going to have more voices and you're going to have a, a more uh, heterogeneous group and that's going to, that's going to um, at least be fairer, whether it's more moral or not. But I would say one thing as a cautionary note, and that is that the history of the world is about, the, about cultures being devoured. The history, you know, there are 7,000 languages in the world. Two of them are disappearing every day. Uh, some people think that's a terrible thing. It's not a terrible thing, or, I, you know, I will res reserve judgment. It's just what happens. To the extent that culture separates people, it's bad. To the extent to which it connects them, it may be a good thing. But we are going into a situation where there's a much greater blending, um, and that's going to change the nature of those influences fairly substantially. It'll be interesting to see whether it's dilutive of some things or reinforcing of others. But, but it's going to change. And you know, the, the, way, the way culture is distributed today is radically different from the way it was distributed 20 years ago because of communications technologies and so forth. And I don't think, you know, I mean, I, I, there, the, we, we live in a, a viral civilization in which ideas can spread globally instantaneously. And, and ideas are the foundation of culture, and they are also a corrosive agent with regard to culture. And I'm not sure how that's going to play out, but it is definitely going to ch create a, a, a changing moral environment in which these people can operate. Yes, sir? Well, first of all, I always love it when I, and I, I think it must be a defect in me personally. Because I like write a book that's a history of the NSC and people go, okay, well, that's the history of the NSC, so now what? It's like, well, I was, I was just writing a history of the NSC, okay? You, you, fig you, you figure it out. Um, um, you know, I don't, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm attempting to do one thing, which is to say the power structure of the planet Earth isn't what we think it is. And that the power structure of the planet Earth is really relevant to everybody's life. And it is incredibly inequitable. And it is leading 
not to discomfort. It is leading to deprivation, pain, and death on a massive global scale, and it's not sustainable, and it's going to produce a backlash. You decide, you, you decide which side of that tug of war you want to be on. Okay? You decide which elements you wish to support and how you wish to work within that system. I am reporting a system. I could tell you what I think, you know. Well, if you can't pick it up from what I've said, I don't think I can help you. Okay, if, 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 if you haven't picked up on the notion that uh, uh, I think that these inequalities can't stand, that we need stronger global institutions, that we need institutions based on a balance between freedom and justice and not an overabundance of focus in one direction, that morality is important in the way that societies are created, that misrepresentation of groups like women or people who are of different colors or a different culture is a flaw in a power structure, and that I believe in democracy as a foundation of government that is more important to me as a concept than sovereignty is as a concept, and that we are now part of a global community and that we need how to use the same values that we would in a small town in Vermont with regard to a global community that we use, uh, that, 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 then we would improve the world significantly if we did that. Um, you know, I, I thought that was coming out of what I was saying, and if it wasn't, I apologize. But you know, I think you know, very often in the United States particularly, we say, well, you know, I live in a small town. I have small town values. It's a wonderful thing. And then he said, well, what if one family in your town had most of the money and didn't reinvest it in the town and didn't feel like they had to obey the law? How would you feel about that? And how would the town feel about it? Well, they would hate it. And they would show that, that family um, that, that they can't continue that way in the context of the town. Well, we are that family. We are the ones with that power. You probably very few of you will actually become members of the superclass. But you will become part of the next group down that advises them and acts on their behalf, that benefits immensely, that makes tens of millions of dollars or millions of dollars, not hundreds or billions. And you have a choice about the role that you want to play within that system. And you know, my simple message is that the fundamental values that shaped the founding of the United States and that shaped the founding of modern civilizations about equity, about justice, about rule of law, about having institutions to balance out in imbalances in power are things that we need on a global scale, not just on a national scale, and we don't have them. 